We have a missionary letter this morning from our missionaries, the Peelers, and they are doing further relief and maintenance. Um, it says, we are so thankful how God is using us for his work. In our last letter, we told you about an opportunity to go to Yap, Micronesia, and help the missionary there with the Christian School Building Project. God has provided the means to get to this field. We're flying out on February 21st, so they're already there, uh, and they expect there to be there until the end of March. They had a few hiccups in the process, but God is faithful to supply. Um, God supplied them with an the additional $1,000 they needed for the trip, so they, they've been moving out there. So we're working on several projects to finish the buildings uh, of a school that's there, and it'll be in use next year. There are over 100 students packed into lower level right now with the anticipation of more students in the coming year. They really need the upper level space. Uh, Melinda will be helping out in the second grade classroom while the teacher is on a maternity leave. This will be a new experience for her, so she covers your prayers our calendar for the summer is full as well. When we return from Yap, we will need to get our camper ready for travel. I'm ready to get mine ready too. I'm itching to get out and go camping. But we have a couple of repairs to make before our May departure. Uh, the refrigerator repaired, water pumped replaced, and wheel bearings need to be repacked. These shouldn't be too costly, but will involve some time. Upon our revival, the first project will be to build two food service tables for a camp ministry. After these are completed, we'll re renovate a space for a pastor to use as an office. Both these projects will take about two months, take us into July. Later in the summer, we plan to be in three other churches for some shorter projects. Please pray about a problem I'm having with my hand. I will be having a cortisone shot on it before going to YAP. Pray this will save or solve the issue and will not need any surgery. Uh, Melinda's problem with her hip has been corrected with an invasive, without any invasive treatments, so we're thankful for God's healing there. So some prayer requests. Uh, uh, pray for safe travel, uh, effective ministry in YAP, healing for Brother Peeler's hand, uh, and for the churches in Pompano and Nakuro, and good health for Pastor Ray that's there. We're so thankful for all of you who sacrificially give to us and pray for us. May the Lord bless you all as you seek to serve him. It's an amazing ministry how God uses them uh, to go here and to go there, to fill in the, the gaps in a ministry. Uh, and they are um, willing servants. They've given their lives to the Lord and told him, wherever you need us, Lord, send us and we will go. So amazing folks that will, will go wherever God calls them to go without any, any reserve at all. Heavenly Father, just thank you for the peelers who, who step up to fill the gaps in ministry, Lord, to step in when folks are sick, to step in where things need to be built, repaired. Lord, your, your master hand moves amongst them and in their lives. Lord, just pray as they uh, continue with this ministry and, and uh, building project to be done soon, Lord, and that the school can expand. And it's just not any school, Lord. It's a school that teaches the Bible and teaches children about Jesus Christ. Lord, just pray as they travel home and they've, they'll be on the road of their trailer that those things will be they need to be repaired and be fixed quickly. And just pray for the ministry projects that uh, your name would be glorified in all those projects. We just thank you for our part that we have as we pay, faith promise to uh, support them on the field wherever they be. We just thank these for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21 in your Bibles this morning. Numbers chapter 21, and we'll start uh, reading in verse 1 this morning. The Bible says, And when King Arad the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they, other, uh, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place uh, Hormah. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of the land, or out of, up out of Egypt, to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. The title for our message this morning is Our Soul Loatheth This Light Bread. Let's go ahead and pray this morning. Father, I thank you for everyone that's here. I thank you for your word. And I just pray that as we get into it this morning that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray that our soul wouldn't loathe the bread that you've given us, Lord. Uh, but we would be grateful for all of your blessings to us. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to realize the importance of your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So in this chapter, um, it ends, uh, verse 5 ends with that statement, Our soul loatheth this light bread. And I want to look at a few things this morning why I believe brought them to this point where they would say this about God's provision. The, the blessings that God had been given them, that He had been daily given them, and that they had been enjoying, and now they've come to the point where they say, Our soul loatheth this light bread. So I want to look at why the, why the people were in this situation. And the, the first thing that I see in this chapter is they came to this point because of opposition. They came to this point in their life because there were things that came up and there, there were those that were opposing them. And if you look in verse 1, the Bible says, And when King Arad the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. They were facing some great opposition at this time. Uh, not only opposition, but they also had even faced some defeat here. This uh, king had come up against them and he was fighting against them and had even taken some of them prisoner. And I know in my life and in your life also that there's times in life where we can face opposition, where there can be those that are opposed to us. And uh, that can come from many different areas. In this case, it was coming from their enemies. Uh, and if you look through the Israelites' history, it, sometimes it would be from their enemies where opposition would come from. And there would be other times it would be in their own camp and in their own people where they would face opposition. But no matter where that opposition comes from, whether it be other people, whether it be Satan himself fighting against us, uh, whether it even be those that are in our own group, and are even possibly our own church, sometimes we can face opposition just like the Israelites were facing here, and they face this opposition. I believe they had the right response to this opposition in verse 2. The Bible says, And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then it will I utterly destroy their cities. In verse 3, the Bible says, And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel, and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. 
and he called the name of the place Hormah. Listen, they cried out, they cried out to the Lord, if, if you'll deliver them, this is what we'll do. They made a vow to the Lord, and they were asking for God's help here. And that's always a correct response to opposition. But I want you to notice in verse 4, the Bible says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. I think there's something very important missing between verse 3 and verse 4. There's no mention of gratitude on the part of the people here. Listen, they, they made a vow to the Lord and they said, if you'll deliver these people in our hands, this is what we'll do. And God answered their prayer. God delivered uh, the people into their hand. They fought against them. God delivered them. Uh, they destroyed the cities. Uh, but then it just goes right into verse 4 and you never see any mention where they stopped to show gratitude towards the Lord and, and to thank God for the victory that was won. Listen, it wouldn't be... Uh, uh, there's other, other times in the Scriptures where you can look through and they would have times of victory and they would stop and they would thank God for the, the, that victory. Sometimes they would build an altar and they would you know, sacrifice to the Lord and they would praise God for the victory that He had given them. But there's no mention of that in this chapter. It doesn't give us any indication that they were even grateful for the victory that God had given them. They just got up and they started to move on to the next place. And the Bible says, and they journeyed from Mount... And so that's one of the... Uh, I believe they had come to this spot uh, in their life where they would say, Our soul loatheth this light bread. I think it was because of lack of gratitude. Listen, a lack of gratitude in our life will cause us to despise the gifts that God has given us. The uh, Bible says every, perfect, every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above. But when we're not grateful for those gifts and when we don't thank God for those gifts and, we, and we're not, uh, we don't show our gratitude for those daily benefits that He loads us up with, it's not very long before we can become ungrateful. And we can loathe, that despise the things that God has given us. Before It's not long before we start looking around and we start looking for more. And we start looking for better things. But every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above. So I believe it was because of lack of gratitude that they had come to this spot in their life. Um, look at uh, verse number 4. The next thing I see in this passage is discouragement. Verse 4 says, And they journeyed from Mount Horror by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Discouragement has a way of just dragging you down. And discouragement has a, a way of getting your eyes off of God and off of the blessings that He's given you and getting them on to the problems that you face and, and, and the issues that you have in life. Instead of looking to the Lord, instead of looking to God, we can become discouraged. Discouragement is a very real thing and we can all be discouraged. Uh, we're, we're all human, we're all people, and that, that's a thing that we can face in life is discouragement. The Bible says that they were discouraged because of the way. Listen, things had not been going easy for them. And in the chapter before, in chapter 20, uh, Aaron had just died. Uh, it, it, they spent 30 days grieving for Aaron before they come to this chapter. And, I mean, that, that would have been a big deal. Yeah, Moses was their leader, but Aaron was huge in, in the life of the Israelites in this time. And, I mean, this, this, would have, this wasn't some small thing. Aaron had just died, uh, and they spent 30 days grieving for Aaron. And, not, I mean, not long after that 30 days, here they are facing this opposition. And here they are facing all these different problems, and they have a lack of gratitude. And now... They're discouraged. Let me tell you something. A lack of gratitude in your life will always bring you to discouragement. 
it'll always drag you down to a place where you can, I mean, where you just don't feel like anything's going right. Nothing, I mean, and, and you just despise the blessings of the Lord because you're discouraged. And a lot of that stems from a lack of gratitude. But they were discouraged in this passage. The Bible says, And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. If we look at verse 5, I, I see another thing here why they've come to this point where they say, Our soul loatheth this light bread. The Bible says in verse 5, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Listen, what were, what were they doing here? Where, where were they headed? They were headed to the promised land. They were headed to this land that God had promised. I'm, I'm going to give you this land. Listen, if you just follow me, if you just be obedient to me, I'm, the land is yours. I'm going to give it to you. And that's where they're on their way. And now they're saying, listen, you just brought us up out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness. They're doubting the promises of God in this chapter. And I believe this is one of the biggest reasons why they came to this point in verse 5 where they said, Our soul loatheth this light bread because they're now doubting the promises of God. They're saying, God, you just brought us here to die in the wilderness. You don't care about us. The, the promises and the things that you've done for us in the past, they don't mean anything. You've brought us here to die in the wilderness. Some things we need to realize in our life is the promises of God are sure. I mean, they're steadfast. And we, we sang about those promises just earlier, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call. And, but let me tell you, sometimes in our life when we get discouraged and when, they, when we face opposition and there's a lack of gratitude in our life, it can bring us to the point where we start doubting God's promises in our life. God said, I'm going to give you the land. It's yours. I'm going to give it to you to possess it. But they don't believe His promises. They're, they're thinking God's just brought us out here in the wilderness to die. They were going to the land that God had promised them, but because of opposition and lack of gratitude, discouragement and unbelief, they were now doubting God's promises. I see another thing, though, in verse 5. Not only were they doubting God's promises, but they were believing a lie. So let's look at verse 5 again. The, the, it says, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of the land of Egypt to die in the wilderness? And here it is. For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. They've got two accusations against God here in this verse. They said there's no bread. They're believing a lie. You, you can't even make it out of the verse before they say, and our soul loatheth this light bread. They're, they're telling God, you don't, you don't provide for us. There's no bread here. And God had been providing them bread. It, they, they say, we, we loathe it though. We despise it. Our soul loveth this light bread that you're giving us. They're believing a lie that, hey, listen, there's no provision here. God, had, God was providing for them. He was giving them this, this bread. I mean, every day they would go and they would pick it up, this manna off the ground, that God was providing for them day after day. I mean, they didn't even have to work for it. They just got up and it was there. They had to go and collect it. But it was a, it was a provision straight from God. But listen, because of their unbelief in His promises, now they're, they're believing a lie. Not only did they say there's no bread, they say neither is there any water. Well, that would be an important thing, but right in the, the chapter before, it hadn't been much more than 30 days before, shortly before Aaron had died, God provided water for them from a rock. And all the people were able to drink. And all of their beasts were able to drink. God had just provided water for them. I mean, you would think a miracle like that where God provided water from a rock. And they were all able to drink. And their beasts were all able to drink. That they wouldn't forget something like that so soon and so easily. But here they were, it wasn't, I mean, it couldn't have been much more than 30 days. They spent 30 days grieving for Aaron. And there's a few events that 
came before us, so, you know, somewhere around, my guess would be around 40 days, somewhere in that area. Now they're saying there's no water here, even after seeing a miracle like water coming from a rock. And they were all able to drink and their beast. They're accusing God of you don't provide for us, but they were indeed just believing a lie. One of the thoughts that I had when I was reading this passage was every time that we doubt and we don't believe the promises of God, you're going to be believing a lie. Every time you doubt God's promises, without a doubt, you'll be believing a lie. God's promises are true. And so if you're not going to believe His promises, whatever it is that you're believing, whatever it is that you're convinced of, is a lie. It's contrary to God's promise. God said, that, listen, I'm going to bring you into the land. I'm going to, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it. It wasn't even necessary. It was, you know, they needed to be obedient to Him. But God was going to fight for them. He was going to take care of their enemies. He was going to provide for them. And He was doing all of these things. But now they're doubting His promises. And because they're doubting His promises, they're believing lies. It's the same thing, I'm telling you. If you doubt the promises of God in your life, if you doubt the provision of God in your life, you'll start believing a lie every single time. Every time you doubt the promises of God, you'll believe a lie. But this is something I see. This, I, I believe this, these are uh, five things that have brought them to this point where they said, Our soul loatheth this light bread. All these, these five different things, I think, played into it. The opposition and the lack of gratitude and, you know, doubting God's uh, provision and a lack of faith in His, in His promises and believing a lie. It all brought them to this statement where they said, Our soul loatheth this like bread. We can't stand it. I, I mean, we're so sick of it. We're so tired of it. If I eat another piece of it, I'm just going to throw up, basically, is their attitude towards God's provision. You know, things just really haven't changed that much. <laughs> we're, we're here, and, you know, God's given to us exceeding great and precious promises, and He's provided for us. But we're so much like the Israelites. Listen, when... When we face opposition, our eyes are so easily taken off the Lord and focused on the problems that we have. When we face those that come up against us, whether it be, you know, Satan fighting against us or the world fighting against us or even people that we, you know, that we love and that are our family, even, even when times like that come up against us, listen, we, we, we can so easily just take our eyes off the Lord because of opposition. We can so easily become ungrateful for the things that God has given us. But we should never be that way. The Bible says that we're to rejoice evermore and to pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. But I see something very important in this chapter, and I see some, uh, some, uh, some similarities here. If you'll turn over to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And we're, we're going to start reading in verse 28. John chapter 6 and verse 28. I think there's something very important that we see here. And that is the fact that Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is, the, He's the bread of life that God sent down from heaven. And in this, in, in this passage, Jesus Himself is going to, he, he's going to, He's going to point out some things from the, the difference between the manna that God was providing for Moses and for the children of Israel and to Him being the bread of life. And so in verse 28, the Bible says, Then said they unto Him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on Him whom He has sent. They said therefore unto Him, What sign showest thou then, uh, that we may see and believe thee, what dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. 
Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which came down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. Then, they sa uh, then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I am come down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all which he hath given me I shall lose nothing, but should raise it up again at, uh, again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. And then verse 41, the, uh, the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. I, to me, this verse 41 is so similar to the children of Israel saying, Our soul loatheth this light bread. Jesus just said, I'm the bread of life. I'm the one that came down from heaven. The, the, if you want to work the work of the, the Father, if you want to do the will of the Father, the work of the Father is to believe on Him uh, that God has sent, to believe on me. And then in verse 41, the Bible says, The Jews then murmured at Him. Because he had said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Jesus is the bread of life. Uh, he, he, he is the one that gives life. Life is offered through him. Uh, but you know what? Just, just like the, the Jewish people here, again, were murmuring against Jesus. They, that, this bread's not for us. They didn't believe Him. They didn't believe the promises of God. They didn't believe the Scriptures. And they would, say, they would murmur at Him. And uh, they, they would look at Jesus and say, uh, complain against Him because He had said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Jesus is the bread of life. Listen, in, in our life, Jesus is the bread of life for us as well. There, there is no other way. I, I, I also see a similarity in that passage earlier where it says the people were much discouraged because of the way. And then I look where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But so many times we can be discouraged because of the way. We can be discouraged because, you know, things in life aren't always easy. Things in life don't always go the way that we had planned them to go. But Jesus is still the way, the truth, and the life. Listen, we mentioned before that Christians should never have a lack of gratitude. But uh, one of the other things I want to see is, yes, discouragement is real. We looked at discouragement uh, uh, earlier, but we should always remember who God is and we should always hope in Him. Look at Psalms chapter 42 and verse 9. Psalms chapter 42 verse 9. The Bible says, I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, my enemies, my enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Listen, in this passage of Scripture, there's some discouragement here. The enemy is pressing against them daily. The enemy is looking and saying, hey, where's your God? That's what they were saying daily. And the, and the response is, why art thou cast down on my soul? Why are you discouraged? Why are you trodden down? Uh, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Listen, we, need, we, we never need to doubt God's promises. Turn over to 1 Kings chapter 8. I, I love this passage of Scripture, uh, and especially verse 56. We'll start reading in verse 54. 
First Kings chapter 8 in verse 54, and the Bible says, And when it was so, that when Solomon had made an end of praying all this prayer and supplication unto the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord, and kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven, and he stood and blessed all the congregation of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel, according to all that he promised. There hath not fallen one word of all his good promises, which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant. Listen, here Solomon realizes all, all of God's promises that he promised to Moses, every single one of them he kept. Every single one of them he was faithful to keep. Not a single word of all of his good promise, which he promised by the hand of his mo servant Moses. Not a single thing that God had promised. Every single thing God was faithful. Every single time God kept his word. And he was true to what he said. He was true to his promises. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. We'll look at verse 13. There's never ever a reason to doubt the promises of God. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 13 and we'll read through verse 18. The Bible says, For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for uh, confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the in immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to laid hold upon the hope set before us. Listen, Jesus is our hope. God is our hope. And He's the God that cannot lie. He's given us these promises. He's confirmed it with His oath. And He'll never break His promise. There's no reason we should ever doubt a single one of God's promises. Listen, some of those promises uh, are given to us and some of the things that He's promised us, they do depend on, on, uh, on our faith in Him and, and how we are obedient to Him. Some of those promises uh, that God has given us about His provision and the way He's going to guide us and lead us, they are, they are dependent on us being obedient to Him and not fighting against Him. But some of the promises that He's given us once we're saved, those promises are sure. I mean, He's going to keep His promise. Uh, even, even if we don't keep, uh, you know, don't seem to do our end of the bargain, He's always going to keep His promise. There's never any reason to doubt His Word. The Bible says in verse 18 that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. We have exceeding great and precious promises, and God will keep every one of them. We can trust and depend on God's Word. Listen, there's, if we, we mentioned earlier, every time we doubt one of God's promises, we'll believe a lie. And one of the ways that we, one of the things we need to do in order to believe God's promises is know God's promises. Look over in Psalms 119. Psalms 119, and, and we'll start reading in verse 97. Psalms 119, and, and um, turn over to verse 97. The Bible says, Oh, how love I thy law! It is my meditation all the day. Through thy commandments hast thou made uh, hast um, thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditations. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way, that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. 
Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Listen, the best way to keep from believing a lie is by knowing the word of God, by following his word. But I love verse 104 where it says, Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. The, listen, the, that same hatred that the, the Israelites, they loathed that light bread. That's what we ought to be to every false way. We ought to loathe it. We ought to hate it. Uh, but the only way that happens is from knowing God's Word. Uh, it, it starts off in verse say, uh, 97 saying, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. When we make God's Word our meditation and when we uh, dwell on Him, it goes back to Psalms chapter 1 uh, where it talks about the blessed, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And it talks about his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And then it ends, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Listen, because the Israelites loathed God's provision, God sent fiery serpents that bit the people. There was a consequence to their lack of gratitude. There was a consequence for them giving in to the opposition. And, and there was a consequence for them not believing the promises of God. And then there was a consequence finally for them complaining against God's provision. Complaining to God about His provision. When they say, listen, our soul loatheth this like bread. This wasn't the only time where they had come to this point in their history and they were just complaining about God's provision, the things that God had given them. And here they are again and they're complaining about it in Numbers chapter 21. And we know that God sent the fiery serpents that bit the people. But He also provided a way of protection. He provided a way for healing for the people. Once they cried out to God because of their affliction, because of those fiery serpents, God sent a way that they could be saved from them. It's the same way in our life. In John chapter 3 and verse 14, the Bible says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's one of those exceeding great and precious promises that's given to us in the Word of God, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's no need to ever doubt that promise. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There it is again, God's exceeding great and precious promise. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There's some amazing promises in chapter 3 of John. There's some exceeding great and precious promises. And we don't ever need to doubt them. Listen, the Bible starts off in that passage and it says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man lift, be lifted up. Listen, that, that serpent was raised up because of their, their, their punishment for their sin, their, their, their sin against God of unbelief and doubting His promises and complaining against His provision. They, they, they now had these fiery serpents, and this serpent is lifted up in the wilderness. And we know from the story that anyone that looked upon that serpent would be healed. And Jesus said, listen, I'm going to be lifted up. I'm, the Bible, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And that's what he was talking about in, in this passage here. When he, talked, when he said, if I be lifted up, he was talking about his death on the cross. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You know, Jesus was lifted up for every single one of us here in this room. Every single one of us in the world, Jesus was lifted up on, that, on the cross for He's, he's provided provision. Uh, this, this is, he is the way. This, he's the only one that can provide the, uh, the cure for, that, uh, for the sin curse that we're all, that we're all under. Uh, he's the only one that provides that provision. But sometimes 
you know, when we start believing his, when we stop believing his promises, and when we when we're worried about the things that are around us, and when we start doubting his love for us, we can for, we can forget about those promises that he's given us. Listen, one of the song, another one of the songs in the hymnal I like is "Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary." When we start doubting the promises of God, I believe we can always go back to the cross of Calvary, where Jesus, I mean, one of the one of the most amazing promises that He ever did. But you know what? He sealed the promise. He He gave us His only begotten Son. He 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 gave it. He didn't just say uh, that by His word that He was going to give us the promise. He also sealed it with His own blood. Uh, the promises that God has given us are sure. Anyone that calls on Him can be saved. They can be delivered from their sin. If there's anyone here this morning and you've doubted the promises of God, if there's anyone here this morning and you say, you know what, because of opposition or discouragement, or maybe there's been a lack of gratitude, uh, maybe I've been believing a lie. I've been believing something that's not true because I, I've not been believing the promises of God. I'd point you right to the cross of Calvary. And I'd say, if you just go there, if you go to the cross of Calvary, you'll see where God gave His promise. You'll see where God died for everyone, where He paid the price for sin, and where, he, where He's offering eternal life to anyone that will come to Him. There's no reason to doubt the promises of God. If you're here this morning, you're without Christ. You've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. He will save you. It's His promise. It's His promise that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's His promise that if we'll believe His Word, if we'll believe on Him that God sent, that we can be saved. And so if you're here this morning, if you've never done that, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, He's offering that to you this morning. He wants you to be saved. There's no reason to doubt His promise. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for this day. I thank You for Your Word. And I thank You we can depend on Your promises. I pray if there's anyone here this morning, they've never accepted.